Good morning and welcome to the Sunday Celebrations here for the Sinners of Spiritual Living Denver. We are a loving and prospering community here in the heart of Capitol Hill and online. We know that with everything going on, life can feel overwhelming. Here at CSL Denver, we want you to know that we are here for you. Please know that our practitioners are available for prayer work with you. Our names and phone numbers are on the website at www.csldenver.org. Or if you have a prayer request, please email it to info at csldenver.org. Reverend Elzia, along with all of our guest speakers, all of our practitioners, our music and service coordinators, want you to know how truly grateful we are for your online support. Thank you for watching our Sunday services, attending our online workshops and events, and providing financial support so that we can keep our virtual doors open. We love you all and know we'll be seeing you in person in the right and perfect time. And now, we'll continue to meet online until further notice. If you're interested in upcoming events and information, we send out weekly newsletters. Please go to www.csldenver.org and sign up for our newsletters. We only send out one per week. Or send an email to info at csldenver.org and request to be put on our mailing list. This week we are having our usual Zoom fellowship right after service. If you haven't already received an email this morning, please send an email to info at csldenver.org to request a Zoom invitation. Please join us. We would love to say hi and catch up with you. That's it for the announcements this Sunday. Again, thank you for tuning in. And now back to our service. I see glory on each face Surely the presence of God is in this place Surely the presence of God is in this place I can feel the mighty power and the grace I can hear the brush of angel wings I see glory on each face Surely the presence of God is in this place Good morning. I'm Alice Nutter, a practitioner here at CSL Denver, and I invite you to join me in our invocation. So if you're comfortable, please sit back and close your eyes. And here we go. Divine Spirit. I recognize the presence of spirit everywhere in the universe, in, as, and through all that exists. The invisible essence of everything and the infinite source of all that divine nature that lives, moves, and breathes all that is. And I know that each one of us on this, um, on this um, 
in the service are one with that divine nature. We are that divine love, that divine light, that divine wisdom. And so as we move into this service today, we so bless uh, Reverend Robert's words and his sharing during the service and with the music from our uh, musical guest, Ray Davis, and all who have chosen to join us this morning, either in person or online later this week, just knowing that spirit is living, moving, and breathing each and every one of us. And we bless all those who are experiencing uh, challenges in life throughout the United States and the world, whether it's uh, weather related, um, conflict related, all that is, just knowing that spirit is here, right here and right now. And I'm so grateful and thankful. I'm so grateful for this teaching. I'm so grateful for CSL Denver. I'm so grateful for all who have chosen to join us this morning. And so from that place of deep, deep gratitude, I release this into that one mind, that one heart, knowing that all is well, and it is so, and so it is. And our reading this morning comes from Ed and Deb Shapiro, called Find Your Peace in the Midst of Chaos. Have you ever been stuck in traffic on a busy street and felt like it was just too much or caught up in an argument that was going nowhere? A great meditation teacher once said there should be no difference between meditating in a cave or in the center of a city because peace is inside us and is not dependent on external circumstances. Although this is undoubtedly true, it is definitely put to the test when your life is full of chaos or anger. Being in touch with your inner peace is not the same as being happy. When difficult or painful things happen, happen such as the loss of a loved one, you will not feel happy, that's for sure. But it doesn't mean you have to lose your peace. Beneath the tears and grief, there can remain a steadiness, an inner stillness, independent of the circumstances. Maintaining that peace, especially when confronted with difficult situations, means being able to let go all the time, constantly, in every moment. You might say, don't even pick that up. For as soon as you begin to hold on, whether to resentment, irritation, hurt, or anger, you create suffering for yourself. Your mind gets caught up in the emotion and you lose your balance. Letting go does not deny your feelings. You can feel all sorts of things, including sadness, joy, anxiety, or laughter. The difference is you're not holding on to those feelings. They come and then they pass. One of the greatest spiritual teachings is the awareness that all things are impermanent that all things come and go, that you cannot cling to anything, not even pleasure, without also creating suffering. As you integrate the truth of this teaching, it's wonderfully liberating, for it brings you back into the present moment. If everything is so impermanent, including yourself and your feelings, then there is no purpose in holding on and trying to make those feelings last longer. Rather, there is far greater joy in releasing them and reconnecting to sanity and peace. Chaos is natural. If you look at the world, it's everywhere. But to find your peace in the midst of chaos is something you have to deal with. Life is unpredictable and will bring about many different emotions and mind states that can be challenging and difficult, even unbearable at times. But beneath all the dramas, distractions, and problems, there is a still and calm place you can rest in. If amidst the turmoil, you can find just one moment of peace in each day, then your whole life will become more joyful. Like the water in a lake, when your mind is calm, you can see the depths below. But when your mind is disturbed, it is easy to get caught up in the waves. Through meditation, you be can become more aware of when emotions arise, so you can take some time to chill out before you they take over. If circumstances cannot be changed, then you can change your attitude toward them. You may not be able to control the wind, but you can adjust your sails. You can either blame others or you can relax into each moment as it arises. When you can just be with the way things are in the present moment, then that you can be free of complications and that freedom is your peace. And now from our founder, Dr. Ernest Holmes from Living the Science of Mind. Realizing that I am one with all people, I affirm that there is a silent power flowing through me and them, which blesses and heals and prospers, makes happy and glad their pathway. And realizing that the world is made up of people like myself, 
I bless the world and affirm that it shall come under this divine government of good, under the divine providence of love, and under the divine leadership of the supreme intelligence. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now here's Ray Davis with the least of these. Thank you. Well, hello, CSL Denver. This is Ray Davis, your musical artist of the month of May, coming to you from Los Angeles, California. I'm grateful to be with you today. Really grateful to be with you this month. It's been wonderful. And the song I have for you today is um, something that takes some inspiration from uh, Matthew 25, a place where Yeshua was recorded to uh, tell a particular story about a king who says, uh, if you've done what you've done to the least of these, my, my uh, brethren, you've done unto me. I'm turning this around and looking at myself in terms of how I'm looking at other people, how I'm treating the so-called least of these, especially in times with so much, so many people seem to be so angry about so much and want to point fingers. It's their problem. They're, they're the ones to blame. They're the ones to blame. No, no, no. I want to check the heart first. So this is called the least of these. I've got something on my mind And it's high time for my confession To the world I may seem kind And a success in my profession But when I search deep in my soul I find a hole about the size of your oppression And I wonder I wonder, could it be the solution is calling for me? Whatever I've done to the least, whatever I've done to the least, oh, whatever I've done to the least, the least of these. Well, I've done it, I've done it, I've done it to me. Maybe I can see the signs. Maybe I don't want to name it. Maybe I believe some lies, but it breaks my heart to claim it. Oh no, maybe I can see the sound. Oh, come on. Maybe I've been socialized. times as long to do this because I haven't rehearsed. God damn. Let's try it again. Cut it, right? We cut. Action. Maybe I can see the signs. Socialized to me. Where was it? There we go. Action. Hello, CSL Denver. This is Ray Davis, your musical inspiration for the month of May. I'm coming to you from Los Angeles, California, and I'm really grateful to be with you today. I'm, I'm grateful to have been with you all this month. It's, it's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, the song I have for you today is called The Least of These, and part of the inspiration for the song comes from 
Um, a story that Yeshua tells that's recorded in Matthew 25. And the other thing is um, the current unrest. You know, so many people seem to be angry about so many things. They're saying it's the fault of those people, or if those people were only ch to change, or if this institution would change its laws, or that institution, etc. Instead, I'm taking the cue from Yeshua, and I'm looking within. How am I treating the so-called least of these? How am I behaving? How am I, am I giving the love and concern and compassion uh, that I can as a true child of the light? Mm -hmm. This is the least of these. I've got something on my mind And it's high time for my confession To the world I may seem kind And a success in my profession But when I search deep in my soul I find a hole about the size of your oppression Now I wonder I wonder, could it be the solution is calling for me? Whatever I've done to the least, whatever I've done to the least, oh, whatever I've done to the least of these. Well, I've done it, I've done it, I've done it to me. Yeah. Maybe I can see the signs. Maybe I don't want to name it. Maybe I believe some lies, but it breaks my heart to claim it. Ooh. And maybe I've been socialized to minimize the pain you feel and just reframe it. So I'm wondering, wondering now, can I be a solution somehow? Done it to me, yeah. I just can't take it no more. Yeah. Blaming somebody else for my life, for my life. my mind, change my heart, I will open, really open to love, 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 to love, 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 love sweet
whatever I've done to the least, whatever I've done to the least, whatever I've done to the least, to the least of these, the least of these, oh, whatever I've done to the least, whatever, whatever I've done to the least. Oh, whatever I've done to the least, to the least of these. Well, I've done it, I've done it, I've done it to me. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ray. Hello, Center for Spiritual Living, Denver. So good to be with you, dear ones. I'm Reverend Robert Brzezinski. I'm grateful to be here with you. And we have got something special for you today, I got to tell you. Uh, and we're going to explain everything you just experienced and more uh, as we go along today. So I'm, again, I'm grateful to be with you. It's always fun to be with CSL Denver. You are a place, a space, and a face of love and love is in the air today regardless of the talk title love is in the air i do want to also say a quick thank you uh to practitioner alice uh, for all the great words and, and what she brought to help set the tone for what we're going to experience today for those that might be wondering reverend elzia is off uh helping his youngest son graduate from college and being a part of that celebration and i gotta say if you don't know he was at the Abs game yesterday in St. Louis. So representing the Abs, go Elzia, go Abs. They did win that game, by the way. So uh, we know that his cheering and uh, his willingness to represent Denver went a long way there last night. All right, let's jump on into this. I want to share a couple of quotes with you to get started. Uh, first up, Eckhart Tolle, where there is anger, there is always pain underneath. Where there is anger, there is always pain underneath. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, for every minute you're angry, you lose 60 seconds of happiness. Didn't know we were doing a little bit of math this morning, did you? And from Jennifer Hadley in her book, The Daily Shot of Spiritual Espresso, the anger I felt propelled me to find a spiritual solution that led to the best part of my life. So yes, we're talking about anger today. And uh, as many know, this is part of the Centers for Spiritual Living annual theme. We're looking at emotions all month this month. Last month, uh, Reverend Elsie gave us a great list of the primary uh, emotions that we experience. And today's talk is supposed to be titled Facing Anger with an Open Heart. However, you guys all know me a little bit. I had to change that a little. It's looking anger in the eye. Looking anger in the eye is what we're going to talk about today. Now, you may remember if you're looking at that character going, why is that familiar? It's from a great movie by Inside uh, by Disney called Inside Out. If you haven't seen the movie, please do go check it out. And uh, it's a great movie on emotional intelligence. And that's part of what we're going to be talking about today as well. So <clears throat> it's all about anger. It's all about looking anger in the eye. Now. Anger comes in many forms, and we can direct our anger towards ourselves or others. Our musician today, Ray, did a great, he gave us a great example of how to look anger in the eye. Express it, feel it, don't have to get all wrapped up into it, don't have to let it impact your future performance, and come right back with a heart of love to do what we're here to do. So thank you, Ray, for that great example. Now, in your life, anger might look a few different ways. It might look like this, especially if you're talking to, you know, one of those big telecom companies or those big, huge corporations. And maybe it looks like this, somebody angry at you, 
somebody pushing their anger in your direction. There seems to be a lot of anger going on here. In America today, I think we have a, an anger pro issue. I think we need to uh, move in the direction of em experiencing our anger, but not allowing, not necessarily, not pushing our anger on others, not projecting our anger out into to the world with others. Remember, Eckhart said, where there is anger, there is always pain underneath. And that pain shows up in a lot of different ways for a lot of different people. I'm going to invite you today to call to mind something that you've experienced perhaps over the last couple of weeks that brings forward pain, that, that reminds you of your pain. We're going to hold that gently today. And I trust that as we move through this talk and as we move through this time together, uh, we're going to be able to look at how to let go of that pain or at least channel that pain and transmute that pain. Now, I, I love that word transmute. And I always like to remind people exactly what we mean when we say transmute around here. The dictionary definition is to change or alter in form, appearance, or nature especially to a higher form. So what we're going to do is we're going to transmute the pain into a higher expression of itself, which might be peace, which might be love. The pain, the anger, we need to transmute that into something more. So Eckhart also gave us... Uh, a great reminder that in many ways, when we look at the human life and the human condition, we have these four aspects, spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical. We have our physical body, our mental body, our spiritual body, our emotional body. And we can feel pain or and or anger at any of these different aspects. And it was Eckhart that added on the pain body on top of all of that. The pain body encompasses all of those. So as we go today, keep in mind, what is that pain that's been striking you? I'm going to share uh, in just a moment or two a, a piece of the, the pain that I've been feeling for quite a while now. And we talk about it a lot. And it's actually two, two pieces of pain. And they impact to some degree, not my physical body directly, but they impact my emotional and my mental body, very much so. And the solution to help alleviate the anger I feel from that is through the spiritual our spiritual practices. And one of the things about anger is if left unchecked, anger becomes hate. So today's talk is not something that we get to, uh, uh, you know, kind of say, oh, yeah, that was nice. I'll put that in. Maybe I'll look at that at another time. No. Today is our call and our opportunity to look anger in the eye. To look at ourselves and say, what is it that causes, what is it that drives my anger? What is it? How do I express when I am angry? So that it does not lead to pain or, so excuse me, so it does not lead to hate. Hate is by far one of the most destructive emotions. And the truth is, I personally, if I find myself in that place, that's the marker. That's the place. Oh, I got to stop. And it, and it couldn't be, it can be. Uh, innocuous, like, oh, I, I hate it when I get stuck in traffic. Oh, hold on, time out. There's a place to work. There's a place to use our practices to do our work. Or I hate it when this happens, or I hate it when that happens. So our first step, number one, is to become aware. When we become aware of our language, when we become aware that we are pushing these feelings out there in the world, that's the first step. The second step is to interrupt what that that my language. 
long ago when I first got into this philosophy, I, I would use that word hate quite a bit. And through my early education, the early classes, I realized that is way too strong of an emotion to just be casting about willy nilly and throwing around like nothing. But I had to change my behavior. And I did that by changing my language. It doesn't mean I didn't still have the emotion. It doesn't mean that I didn't still have the trigger. It doesn't mean that I don't still have those emotional triggers today. It just means that I've used these principles to redirect my consciousness and recognize, okay, here is something. How am I going to describe it? I'm going to describe it as I highly dislike that. I highly dislike being stuck in traffic. I highly dislike race-based aggression and hatred and violence. I highly dislike the unlimited proliferation of use uh, of gun usage in our country today. I highly dislike when those two things come together. When we start to look at all these things, I found this diagram and I wanted to share it with you because I think it's so important. See, we're already talking about the awareness of our emotions and then the management of my beha- of our behaviors. When I feel that emotion rise up, I just have to be aware of it. When I feel, see those emotions rising up in the world, in the country, out in society, then I have social awareness. And that awareness leads me to change my behavior, manage myself better. You notice that, again, our dear friend Ray didn't let his moment of, of anger cause him to fail a second time to mess up to have to do the song two or three or four times got in it the second time and it's done out in the social world that is our relationship management so i'm managing how i interact with those around me whether it's online or in person whether it's in the supermarket or sitting in traffic and then the work becomes how i perform in the world and how I evaluate the performance of those around me. Life gives us the reminders I believe we need to be able to manage our anger so that it doesn't become the hate. And Master Yoda said it quite well also, fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. Master Yoda had a lot of good ones. That's one of my favorites. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. So whenever we find ourselves in any case state of fear, Fear that the rent won't get paid. Fear that uh, the snow will bring the trees down on my house or my power lines. Fear that, that this guy's got a gun. Or fear, even for others, fear that someone else might not have enough. Fear that someone else might be impacted by actions of another. It's really easy to get into, go from the fear to the anger like that. Zero to 60, fear to anger, like that. And it's, as I've said, if left unchecked, the anger becomes hate really, really quickly. And then when we're in a state of hate, the absolute outcome has to be that we are personally suffering. We may not recognize that, but we are. I'd like to introduce you to someone, someone I've never met, someone I knew nothing about until last Saturday. Last Saturday was one of those days. It was one of those days for me where my anger was up. I, I got to be honest, I am angry because two of the things that I feel most call that I that that, that pain me the most race-based violence and unchecked gun usage 
and gun violence, race-based violence and hatred, and gun violence. So I'd like to introduce you to Aaron Salter Jr. Aaron looked anger, looked fate, looked hate in the eye last Saturday. Aaron's a security guard at the top supermarket in Buffalo, New York. What I've learned is his mother was a checker for that same supermarket for many, many years. She was not in, and she's already made her transition. Aaron was a former Buffalo police lieutenant of over 30 years before he retired. He had one credit more to complete in his college degree. He was 55 years old. And he went back to school to get his degree and was one credit shy. Now, the college, uh, Kinesius, I'm hoping I'm saying that right, Kinesius College in Buffalo uh, gave him a posthumous degree and awarded him the degree. Did the degree. And Aaron Salter's son, Aaron III, accepted that degree. Aaron loved working with cars and had started his own company, his own business to bring forward hydrogen powered vehicles. He was working towards solutions in our world. And he was doing what he always did. He was a husband. He was a father. He was a son. He was a brother. He was, he was an uncle. He was a man of his community. And in our lives, I believe the world is a lesser place that Aaron isn't here. And yet, to the last breath, he gave his gifts by staring, looking anger in the eye. We honor Aaron. And I am pained. I am angry that once again, I am in a place where we're talking about this nexus, this intersection of race-based hatred and violence and gun violence. And yet we are, which means we still got work to do. We have to transmute the anger, the pain that, that, that we feel ourselves when events like this happen into something different, into a different form a different appearance. We have to change the nature of our emotions to a higher form than the pain, the anger, and the hatred. See, Aaron was one of us. Aaron was family, whether we knew it or not. And family takes a lot of different perspectives. Maybe this represents your family. Maybe your family looks more like this. Or perhaps maybe your family looks more like this. Maybe your family has chosen just one child rather than many. Maybe your family is multi-generational with three or more generations living under the same household, under the same roof. Maybe your family has two moms or two dads or maybe more than two parents. Maybe your family practices different customs and, and lives by a different culture. Maybe you're a single mom or a single dad. Maybe your family doesn't have children. Maybe you're part of the one human family. I want you to take a look at that picture for a minute and I want you to find yourself because this picture represents all of us. You are there. You are part of this one human family. We are all one. And where one part of my family is injured or is in pain, uh, then I, I, I have to look at that pain. I have to look at that anger. I have to look at that hatred in the eye and be willing to say, we transmute this. We shift this. We change this. We are the ones we've been waiting for to change all of this. Recently, I was actually late last night, actually, as I was writing this talk, I was introduced to um, a video clip. Now, 
this happened, uh, and I'm going to share just a couple minutes of this video with you. A couple of uh, about a month ago now, Lionel Richie was awarded the Congressional Gershwin Award, and he was on stage to accept that award. And at the in the conclusion of his talk, um, this is what he said, and I'd like to share this with you. I am celebrating tonight a collaboration of me and God because we made a pact, or I made a pact to him, her, them, or they. I want to make sure that's correct. I made a pact that if you allow me to be a lyricist, and to write words that touch people, I will make sure that I get the message that love, love is the only answer to everything we're doing. <clears throat> I said it last night. I said it last night and I'll say it tonight. I travel the world and all people really want me to say is I love you. All they want to hear is, I love you. They all have mothers, they all have fathers, they all have sisters and brothers and family. We're all one big family. There's no place else to go. There's no place else that we live. So as I travel around the world, I realize we're all the same. We may live in different places, but these songs are as popular on the other side of the world as they are here in DC. I love you is forever. The only words that the world wants to hear. And the day we finally realize that we're a family and not a tribe. We're a family and not a party. We're a family. The day that happens, we will clearly be united together as one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lionel Richie. I don't think I could have said it any better. We must recognize we are united as one. That's what this whole philosophy is built upon over a hundred years or more now. And this whole philosophy is built on the idea that deeply we are one. We are family. We're not red states and blue states, purple states. We're not these folks and those folks. And we are one, we are one human family. So how do we go about this? How do we go about this concept of transmuting anger, hate, into love, into peace? How do we transmute that? Well, that's why we're here, folks. That's why this philosophy, this community, this spiritual center exists. Because we've been following the words of Ernest Holmes for a long, long time now. And there are people in your midst the professional practitioners of your community that have done a lot of work and a lot of training to support you when you're having a tough time seeing the love or seeing the peace or making the shift from one to another. Ernest Holmes wrote in The Science of Mind, when using treatment, which is our form of prayer, the practitioner first realizes their own being as spiritual. Now, I want to make a distinction here. Holmes uses the word practitioner, and I firmly believe there is a difference between a practitioner and a professional practitioner. Professional practitioners, as I've mentioned, and there's numerous ones in your community, Alice here today, representing other practitioners of your community, they've done more extensive study and more extensive practice, but you, everyone, has the ability to practice this philosophy, these teachings. 
So when using prayer, our form of prayer, affirmative treatment, the practitioner first realizes their own being as spiritual. Then we identify a false belief and bring the evidence of truth. In such degree as this acknowledgement is complete, our petition is transmuted into acceptance and the mind feels that the object of its desire is already an accomplished fact. You get it? All we got to do is bring the truth. We are one family. We are love. And we must love like never before. Holmes, in another section of the textbook, this is all on page 59, writes, one should treat any given proposition until they prove their principle, no matter how long it takes. Lionel Richie said, maybe one day we'll finally realize we should treat until we get results, no matter how long it takes, until we come to a realization that we are one family and that love is the sole impulse of our work here until there comes into our objective experience, the actual outpouring of our subjective word treat until our objective experience is an actual outpouring of our subjective ideas, our word. Next paragraph down, he writes, the practitioner must know and must state that there is no obstacles in the pathway of truth. And I want you to know when Ernest Holmes uses capital letters. He really means it. When he capitalizes a single word, it is a, uh, it's a reference to the divine aspect of that word. But when he starts using all capital letters through an entire sentence, it is something important that he wants us to know. And that's exactly what he did in the book. And that's the way I've presented it here. The practitioner, you, Every one of us, every one of the, on this planet must know. We must come to the knowing and must be willing to say it, to state that there are no obstacles in the pathway of truth. No matter what it might look like. Even if it looks like somebody with a gun. There are no obstacles to the pathway of truth. And a little bit farther down, he says, again, the practitioner must know that no mistakes can hinder or obstruct the flow of divine intelligence through God's idea. And God's idea is perfect being. Manifesting the attributes of God in freedom, happiness, activity, and power, and that this truth is now manifest in their life. I believe more than ever before, we are being called to demonstrate the principles and the practices that we believe. And it's not that hard. We just got to get into it. We just have to do it. And so before I join in prayer, and that is how we do it, before we pray this up, I'd like to share with you a affirmation to take with you this week. I transmute my anger into a force of love for my human family. Now, I know it's kind of weird because we can't hear each other and we're not all in the same room, but would you say that out loud with me right now, whether you're watching live or on a replay, speak this out loud right now. I transmute my anger into a force of love for my human family. One more time, this time with your eyes closed. Follow along, you know it. I transmute my anger into a force of love for my human family. Every one of them, no matter what. I transmute my anger into a force of love for my human family. What a great way to work, to move into the week. Our call today is to go into the world and be love and allow yourself to be loved. Go be love. Transmute your fear, transmute your anger, transmute any hate you may experience or see or feel into a vibration of love and be that in the world. 
and let everyone around you, let the world, let everyone you encounter love you in return. For if you cast out that vibration of love, that, that vibration must return. Deeply we are one. If you're in a safe space and comfortable, and I invite you to close your eyes and join me in a, in a prayer. Join me in an affirmation, a recognition that there is only one life. That life is God's life. That life is perfect. And that life is my life, your life right now. That we are each and every one of us a, a vital aspect of this one human family that is billions and billions and billions of heartbeats strong. That we are each a unique emanation of the divine. That we each have a unique set of gifts and skills and talents to bring to the world. Would be it song or dance or thought or word. No matter what it is, there is that within you that must be expressed. I know the world would be a much, much lesser place without each one that is here each one that hears these words, each one touched by the collective vibration we are raising up together. But this is not me doing this work. This is the family doing this work. This is all of us doing this work. This is the divine flowing through every one of us to bring forward love. And that alone is enough. Love Peace is the byproduct of the love. Compassion is a byproduct of the love. Abundance and prosperity, the truth of humanity, all byproducts of one soul impulse in the world, which is to love and be loved. That is our call. That is our mission. That is the work we are here to do this day, to the next day, every day, to love and be loved. Love and be loved. That is the call. And so I affirm this truth. I speak this word. I, I raise up this vibration of peace and love and harmony and truth and all of it into the world so that we each may give of our gifts, so that we may each feel that inner call, that inner drive to love unconditionally. To love. So I am grateful for the opportunity to be this love, to be in this sacred community. As I release this word into that universal law that must take this prayer and make form, must take this prayer and create experience, must, by the laws of the universe, this word must be made demonstrated, must be made manifest. But that's not my job. I let the divine do that. We cast this word into that law in full confidence and faith that it is already being operated upon, that the divine universal law is already operated upon this prayer, and let it be. And if any word here has resonated in any way, I invite you to join me in an affirmation of truth as we say together. And so it is. And so and so it is. Thank you, dear ones. Thank you for being here today. I'm going to get out of the way and I'm going to go be love. <laughs> Thank you, Reverend Robert. Powerful talk today. I really appreciate it. I'm going to have to watch it several times and take notes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll send you the slides. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay. And now is time for our offertory. And we are so, so grateful and blessed for everyone's support of CSL Denver, whether it's in time, treasure, or talent, and especially during this time of change. We feel your love and thank you so much, and we send our love back to you. Whether this is your first time joining us or you are a returning community participant, we want to thank you, thank you for your continuing financial support of the important work we are striving to provide. Right now, there are several ways you can make your financial contribution to Center for Spiritual Living Denver, and this information is running along the bottom of the screen. You can either do text to give, uh, go on to our website and do push the donate button, or you can write us a check and send it to our P.O. box, which is uh, along the bottom there. So please take your gift in your hand or even just holding your hand over your heart and repeat with me our usual affirmation. This perfect gift is spirit in form circulating and blessing all that it touches freely i give and joyously i receive and so it is and now we just have one announcement for uh today our usual virtual fellowship on zoom is this morning 
We would love for you to come and join us and let us know how you're doing. And we can discuss anger and love, the knowing that it's all about love. If you did not receive the Zoom invitation earlier this morning, please send an email to info at csldenver.org and mention fellowship, and we'll send you a Zoom invitation right away. And meanwhile, we hope you have a wonderful week and affirm right here and right now that 2022 is blessed and perfect in all that it is. We love you. We miss you. Please take care of yourselves. Let's close out with I release and I let go. There was a time in my life Thought I had to do it all for myself Didn't know the grace of God was sufficient I didn't know the love of God was at hand If you